And unfortunately, depending upon this, there's a lot of single family, big families out there. And I go to the market a lot to buy. I shop every day. And the reason why? Because I don't know what I want. Uh, I mean, I'm in school, so I stop at the market. And I'll go, and at 4.30, every roasted chicken on the planet is flying off the shelves. And you stop and shop or shrug, I'm, not, I'm just getting the name. But what's interesting about that is to see that people are buying this and they'll stop and they'll grab maybe a bag of potatoes and a head of lettuce. And for seven, eight bucks, you can do four people in a heartbeat. But there's a convenience level. Do I want to do this? Or do I want to stop and get a bucket of Kentucky Fried Chicken? It's a problem. Beth and Eliza, anything you want to add to the challenge of our environment? <clears throat> I would agree that I think the school lunch program or something in the state's done a very good job of um, starting the process. It is a difficult process to work on. Um, I, as a pediatrician, some children I only have the privilege of seeing once a year, and um, there definitely are children that gain 15 pounds in one year. And my next question to them is, did you have to go into subsidized school lunch this past year? And the answer is yes. So um, do the economic changes that are happening to many of our families and the stresses that we all know about, these sub subsidized lunches are very important. Um, but when children rely on them, or they rely on the lunch and the breakfast, that's a double win. Um, it's hard. It, it's really, really hard. Was um, And I would just kind of reinforce the issue of reinforcement. Um, that, you know, either the parent, or both the parents and the schools, or the child care facilities, or the health care providers, all need to be kind of reinforcing this message of healthy eating and being active. Um, and, and being conscious of what's being marketed to you and being able to kind of overcome that. And I think, you know, it, it does a disservice if the schools are working really hard and then somebody else isn't because then it's, it's almost undermining either the parents or the schools and the teachers are just being able to kind of all say we all have a piece in this, we're, we all need to kind of work together on this and we all need to make sure that we're putting these messages out to, to these kids in a fairly similar way so that they're getting it and they're understanding it each message in each encounter in each setting. So we've sort of lived out the problem. And I'm going to ask, ask all of our panelists now to talk a little bit about many of the behaviors, beliefs, and habits that begin to form from birth are mostly influenced by parents and primary caregivers. So I'd like our panelists to share with us their perspective on what can parents and caregivers do to promote healthy behaviors, beliefs, and habits, and how can communities support them in doing that? Anybody who wants to start can start. Or I'll volunteer somebody. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, Thank you. I, you know, as pediatricians, this is what we do: is we uh, and give anticipatory guidance at every appointment. Um, and how many of us, when our children are young, remember spending five minutes getting the child ready to go on that event and twenty minutes packing up the bag with all the snacks and the juice boxes and the water bottles and all the other stuff? That stuff isn't necessary. Um, children can go 20 minutes in the car without having to do something to distract them. Um, and so I, I think we need to remember that. Um, again, I'm a scientist, so I live in a world of studies. A study was published just last month that showed that toddlers, their daily diet, one third of it is snack foods. Um, that's something we've created. Um, and so I think one way we can get away from that is to realize that kids can experience life without having something in their hand. And we also need to teach our grandparents. Um, again, it's a generational state. We have multi uh, dimensional families in the state were wonderful, but generations ago, children were rewarded at grandma and grandpa's house um, with, or Vovo's house, with um, food, right? Wonderful soup, but when Vovo gives other things than soup, um, it becomes a little bit more problematic. So many times, my discussions is beyond the exam room, and it's also talking to everybody who loves this child should love them without food, um, and love them in different ways, and let's not reward children with food. Rewards are, are more tangible, such as let's go out and kick a ball. Let's you get ten minutes of mom's um, undivided attention. Let's read a book. Uh, let's let's do something else. Food is not always the focus. The other challenge is that um, culturally, for many cultures, having round cheeks is the key. It means you've made it, and that's a, a barrier that I think is a little bit harder to overcome. Our colleagues in the health centers struggle with this on a regular basis is what the message we're giving of healthy eating and healthy exercise directly smacks into their need to say, I'm here, and we're good, and it's okay, and we are doing just fine. And so the struggle that many of us have in our clinic settings and our office settings is how to bridge those two, keep the culture intact, keep that family um, feeling about themselves very strong and proud, but to do it in a way that does not cause those cheeks to be surrounded. Dorothy. Yeah. Um, 
One is, is we definitely need to take every opportunity, like Kids in the Kitchen um, and other programs, to teach parents and caregivers um, about healthy eating and about the importance of physical activity. Um, as I stated before, we missed a generation. We really role modeled some very bad habits, um, and we have a generation of parents who really became removed and separated from cooking, from real food. Um, and I think of the 60s, I think of the 60s when all of these new processed products were coming. Duncan Hines cake mixes, um, Tang, you know, that, that these were great products um, for families to have, and it was a sign of wealth and, and prosperity to, to use these products. Um, and they became more and more and more convenient and less and less and less nutritious. Um, so reteaching our families, our parents, our caregivers about what real food, whole food is through farm experiences, through gardening experiences, through school experiences, wherever we can get them, through at the pantries, I'm looking at Erica, you know, anywhere that we can get them, wherever they're flying about, give them the opportunity to learn something and taste something healthy. Um, and then from there, it's providing environments again that role model, that role model this healthy concept. And um, I'll be a little bold and say, okay, we've got our schools trying really hard to, and it's not perfect in every environment, but we've come a long way um, in, in role modeling healthier eating in many of our Rhode Island schools. But they can, the children and their families, essentially walk across the street or down the road or drive a mile and they go to a hospital or a diabetes clinic and they're faced with a soda machine. So we're, we're mixing up our messaging and we're not being consistent in terms of teaching and role modeling what healthy is. Um, so, so I'm thinking, okay, we need more institutions in the community where we have some control and where there really is responsibility to role model healthy. And so that more than just schools, hospitals, diabetes clinics, other healthcare facilities, workplaces, Johnson and Wales, <laughs> is role modeling healthy so our community can see it in more than one place. And that way they're getting that messaging over and over and over again. And over time, we will shift our culture. Right. Years ago, the television used to be the babysitter at home. Now it's the snack bag as the babysitter. Um, I see it constantly. Uh, the games that they were talking about, getting exercise, doing jumping jacks, and doing this is very difficult because the kids have all the electronic toys. I see them as long as six and seven years old with cell phones, and all they do is that everybody walks around with their head down and they're texting. So the exercise they're going to get, maybe they get copper tunnel when it's all over, <laughs> but. That's one, that's one of the biggest issues that you're having. And if you walk into a market, the snack aisle and the soda aisle are the two largest aisles, volume-wise and profit-wise, out of any supermarket in the country. And it's so easy to go down and just grab anything. And, you know, I go to the market, I see this all the time in the industry, especially in the kitchen. We have students that a freshman, we get an 18-year-old kid, I'm not, I don't want to sound condescending, but you show them uh, a red onion, and they've never seen one before. So it's, it's pretty, they want to get into the food business because the television has a lot to do with it as far as every time you turn the TV on, you guarantee you can find a food program going on somewhere. And what they're doing is they're advertising. After they do the food program, there's always a snack. And I can guarantee if you watch, if you eat a dinner, and you turn on, a kid turns on that show and watches Man versus food, the guy eats, I don't know, a 32 pound hamburger, they're going to be hungry in about five minutes. So a lot of this is becoming subliminal. And the culinary school, we're so busy today, there are 700 schools now in the United States. Uh, there are only two 25 years ago, and it's because of the Food Network, because they're promoting this. And uh, I'm not I'm nothing against the Food Network, but there's nothing wrong with healthy eating. I mean, I eat, everybody should have ice cream cones every single one of you have to sit there and eat a dozen ice cream cones? No. That's a whole thing. Moderation has a lot to do with it. Okay? We over-moderate sometimes. And you come to my kitchen to school, I probably have 25 quarts of heavy cream in the refrigerator. And people look at it, well, we use it, but it's used discreetly. It's used, you know, everybody should enjoy it. What's wrong with having a glass of wine? Or what's wrong with having a beer? We drink a whole case and there's going to be some issues, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I mean, it happens with everybody. I mean, you should enjoy having something 
nice, but it, the whole thing is education. I, I keep going over and over again. I keep sounding like a broken record with education, but the kids have to be educated, and the, and the foundation starts in the home place. That's the first thing they do. Eliza. Um, well, I think, you know, speaking as somebody who works in this field and somebody who is a parent, um, I can see that parents have a big responsibility. They have a lot to do. Um, I think one of the key things is they have to know what to do. They have to at least have some basic level of knowledge around what's healthy, what they should do with their kid. And in my opinion, a lot of that starts um, in pregnancy. I think that you know people really need to start thinking about if there's habits that they have to change because the next thing is parents really need to be role models. And it is hard. It is really hard. My son, he's four years old, 